Part two, The Shoulder Shrug, featuring a girl made of darkness, the joy of cigarettes, a town walker, some dead letters, Hitler's birthday, 100% pure German sweat, the gates of thievery, and a book of fire. A girl made of darkness. Some statistical information. First stolen book, January 13th, 1939. Second stolen book, April 20th, 1940. Duration between said stolen books, 463 days. If you were being flippant about it, you'd say that all it took was a little bit of fire, really, and some human shouting to go with it. You'd say that was all Liesl Memminger needed to apprehend her second stolen book, even if it smoked in her hands, even if it lit her ribs. The problem, however, is this. This is no time to be flippant. It's no time to be half watching, turning around, or checking the stove, because when the book thief stole her second book, not only were there many factors involved in her hunger to do so, but the, but the act of stealing it triggered the crux of what was to come. It would provide her with the venue of continued book thievery. It would inspire Hans Huberman to come up with a plan to help the Jewish fist fighter. And it would show me, once again, that one opportunity leads directly to another, just as risk leads to more risk, life to more life, and death to more death. In a way, it was destiny. You see, people may tell you that Nazi Germany was built on anti-Semitism or a somewhat overzealous leader and a nation of hate-fed hate bigots, but it would all have come to nothing had the Germans not loved one particular activity, to burn. The Germans loved to burn things, shops, synagogues, rice dugs, houses, personal items, slain people, and of course, books. They enjoyed a good book burning, all right, which gave people who were partial to books the opportunity to get their hands on certain publications that they otherwise wouldn't have. One person who was that way, that way inclined, as we know, was a thin-boned girl named Liesl Memminger. She may have waited 463 days, but it was worth it. At the end of an afternoon that had contained much excitement, much beautiful evil, one blood-soaked ankle and a slap from a trusted hand, Liesl Memminger attained her second success story, The Shoulder Shrug. It was a blue book with red writing engraved on the cover, and there was a small picture of a cuckoo bird under the title, also red. When she looked back, Lisa was not ashamed to have stolen it. On the contrary, it was pride that more resembled that small pool of felt something in her stomach. And it was anger and, and dark hatred that had fueled her desire to steal it. In fact, on April 20th, the Freuer's birthday, when she snatched that book that from beneath a steaming heap of ashes, Lisa was a girl made of darkness. The question, of course, should be why. What was there to be angry about? What had happened in the past four or five months to culminate in such a feeling? In short, the answer traveled from Himmel Street to the, foyer, to the unfindable location of her real mother and back again. Like most misery, it started with apparent happiness. The joy of cigarettes. Toward the end of 1939, Liesl had settled into life and mulching pretty well. She still had nightmares about her brother and missed her mother, but there were, there were comforts now too. She loved her papa, Hans Huberman, and even her foster mother, despite the abusages and verbal assaults. She loved and hated her best friend, Rudy Steiner, which was perfectly normal. And she loved the fact that despite her failure in, in the classroom, her reading and writing were definitely improving and would soon be on the verge of something respectable. All of this resulted in at least some form of contentment and would soon be built upon to approach the concept of being happy. The keys to happiness, finishing the Gravedigger's Handbook, escaping the ire of Sister Maria, receiving two books for Christmas. December 17th. She remembered the date well, as it was exactly a week before Christmas. As usual, her nightly nightmare interrupted her sleep, and she was woken by Hans Huberman. His hand held the sweaty fabric of her pajamas. The train, he whispered. Liesel confirmed. The train. She gulped the air until she was ready, and they began reading from the 11th chapter of the Gravedigger's Handbook. Just past three o'clock, they finished it, and only the final chapter, respecting the graveyard, remained. Papa, his silver eyes swollen in their tiredness and his face awash with whiskers, shut the book and expected the leftovers of his sleep. He didn't get them. The light was out for a barely minute when Liesl spoke to him across the, the dark. Papa? He made only a noise, somewhere in his throat. Are you awake, Papa? Ja. Up on one elbow. Can we, fin can we finish the book, please? There was a long breath, the scratchery of hand on whiskers, and then the light. He opened the book and began. Chapter 12, Respecting the Graveyard. They read through the early hours of morning, circling and writing the words she did not comprehend and turning the pages toward daylight. A few times, Papa nearly slept, succumbing to the itchy fatigue in his eyes and the wilting of his head. Liesl caught him out on each occasion, but she had neither the selfishness to allow him to sleep nor the hide to be offended. She was a girl with a mountain to climb. Eventually, as the darkness outside began to break up a little, they finished. 
The last passage looked like this. We at the Barron Cemetery Association hope that we have informed and entertained you in the working safety measures and duties of grave digging. We wish you every success with your career in the funer funerary arts and hope this book has helped in some way. When the book closed, they shared a sideways glance. Papa spoke. We made it, huh? Liesel, half wrapped in blankets, studied the black book in her hand and its silver lettering. She nodded, dry mouthed, and early morning hungry. It was one of those moments of perfect tiredness, of having conquered not only the work at hand, but the knight who had blocked the way. Papa stretched with his fists closed and his eyes grinding shut, and it was a morning that didn't dare to be rainy. They each stood and walked to the kitchen, and through the fog and, the, and frost of the window, they were able to see the pink bars of light on the snowy banks of Himmel Street's rooftops. Look at the colors, Papa said. It's hard not to like a man who not only notices the colors, but speaks them. Lisa still held the book. She gripped it tighter as the snow turned orange. On one of the rooftops, she could see a small boy sitting looking at the sky. His name was Warner, she mentioned. The words trotted out involuntarily. Papa said, yes. At school during that time, there had been no more reading tests, but as Liesel slowly gathered confidence, she did pick up a stray textbook before class one morning to see if she could read it without trouble. She could read every word, but she remained stranded as a much slower pace than, than that of her classmates. It's much easier, she realized, to be on the verge of something than to actually be it. This would take time. One afternoon, she was tempted to steal a book from the class bookshelf, but frankly, the prospect of another corridor Vushin as at the hands of Sister Maria was a powerful enough deterrent. On top of that, there was actually no real desire in her to take the books from school. It was most likely the intensity of her November failure that caused this lack of interest, but Lisa wasn't sure. She only knew that it wasn't there. In class, she did not speak. She didn't so much as look the wrong way. As winter set in, she was no longer a victim of Sister Maria's frustrations, preferring to watch as others were marched out to the corridor and given their just rewards. The sound of another student struggling in the hallway was not particularly enjoyable, but the fact that it was someone else was, if not a true comfort, a relief. When school broke up briefly for Vinacton, Lisa even afforded Sister Maria a Merry Christmas before going on her way. Knowing that the Hubermans were essentially broke, still paying off debts and paying rent quicker than the money could come in, she was not expecting a gift of any sort, perhaps only some better food. To her surprise, on Christmas Eve, after sitting in church at midnight with Mama, Papa, Hans Jr., and Trudy, she came home to find something wrapped in newspaper under the Christmas tree. From St. Nicholas, Papa said, but the girl was not fooled. Was not fooled. She hugged both her foster parents with snow still laid across her shoulders. Unfurling the paper, she unwrapped two small books. The first one, Foss the Dog, was written by a man named Matthias Ottelberg. All told, she would read that book 13 times. On Christmas Eve, she read the first 20 pages at the kitchen table while Papa and Hans Jr. argued about a thing she did not understand, something called politics. Later, they read some more in bed, adhering to the tradition of circling the words she didn't know and writing them down. Foss the dog also had pictures, lovely curves and ears and caricatures of German Shepherd with an obscene drooling problem and the ability to talk. The second book was called The Lighthouse and was written by a woman, Ingrid Rippenstein. That particular book was a little longer, so Lisa was able to get through it only nine times, her pace increasing ever so slightly by the end of such prolific readings. It was a few days after Christmas that she asked a question regarding the books. They were eating in the kitchen. Looking at the spoonfuls of pea soup entering Mama's mouth, she decided to shift her focus to Papa. There's something I need to ask. At first, there was nothing. And? It was Mama, her mouth still half full. I just wanted to know how you found the money to buy books. A short grin was, was smiled into Papa's spoon. You really want to know? Of course. From his pocket, Papa took, took what was left of his tobacco ration and began rolling a cigarette, at which Lisa became impatient. Are you going to tell me or not? Papa laughed. But I am telling you, child. He completed the production of one cigarette, flipped it on the table, and began another, just like this. That was when Mama finished her soup with a clink, suppressed a cardboard burp, and answered for him. That saw curl, she said. You know what he did? He rolled up all his filthy cigarettes, went to the market when it was in town, and traded them with some gypsy. Eight cigarettes per book, Papa shoved one to his mouth in triumph. He lit up and took in the smoke. Praise the Lord for cigarettes, huh, Mama? Mama only handed him one of her trademark looks of disgust, followed by the most common ration of her vocabulary, sacurl. Lisa swapped a customary wink with her papa and finished eating her soup. As always, one of her books was next to her. She could not deny that the answer to her question had, had been more than satisfactory. There were not many people who could say that their education had been paid for with cigarettes. 
Mama, on the other hand, said that if Hans Huberman was any good at all, he would trade some tobacco for the new dress she was in desperate need of or some better shoes. But no, she emptied the words out into the sink. When it comes to me, you'd rather smoke a whole ration, wouldn't you? Plus some of your of next doors. A few nights later, however, Hans Huberman came home with a box of eggs. Sorry, Mama. He placed them on the table. They were all out of shoes. Mama didn't complain. She even sang to herself while she cooked those eggs to the brink of bur burned them. It appeared that there, that there was great joy in cigarettes, and it was a happy time in the Huberman household. It ended a few weeks later. The Town Walker the rot started with the washing and it rapidly increased. When Lisa accompanied Rosa Huberman on her deliveries across mulching, one of her customers, Ernst Vogel, informed them that he could no longer afford to have his washing and ironing done. The times, he excused himself. What can I say? They're getting harder. The war is making things tight. He looked at the girl. I'm sure you get an allowance for keeping the little one, don't you? To Liesel's dismay, Mama was speechless. An empty bag was at her side. Come on, Liesel. It was not said. It was pulled along, rough-handed. Vogel called out that from his front step. He was perhaps five foot nine and his greasy scraps of hair swung lifelessly across his forehead. I'm sorry for a Huber Huberman. Liesel waved at him. He waved back. Mama castigated. Don't wave to that arschlock, she said. Now hurry up. That night when Liesel had a bath, Mama scrubbed her especially hard, muttering the whole time about how Vogel saw Krill and imitating him at two minute intervals. You must get an allowance for the girl, she berated Liesel's naked chest as she scrubbed away. You're not worth that much, Samanch. You're not making me rich, you know. Liesel sat there and took it. Not more than a week after that particular incident, Rosa hauled her into the kitchen. Right, Liesel. She sat her down at the table. Since you spend half your time on the street playing soccer, you can make yourself useful out there, for a change. Liesel watched only her own hands. What is it, Mama? From now on, you're going to pick up and deliver the washing for me. Those rich people are less likely to fire us if you're the one standing in front of them. If they ask you where I am, tell them I'm sick. And look sad when you tell them. You're skinny and pale and uh, pale enough to get their pity. Her vocal didn't pity me. Well, her agitation was obvious. The others might, so don't argue. Yes, Mama. For a moment, it appeared that her foster mother would comfort her or pat her on the shoulder. Good girl, Liesel. Good girl. Pat, pat, pat. She did no such thing. Instead, Rosa Huberman stood up, selected a wooden spoon, and held it under Liesel's nose. It was a necessity as far as she was concerned. When you're out on that street, you take the bag to each place and you bring it straight home, with the money, even though it's next to nothing. Go, no, no going to Papa if he's actually working for once. No mucking around with that little sock curl, Rudy Steiner. Straight home. Yes, Mama. And when you hold that bag, you hold it properly. You don't swing it, drop it, crease it, or throw it over your shoulder. Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama. Rosie Huberman was a great imitator and a fervent one. You'd better not, Samenj. I'll find out if you do. You know that, don't you? Yes, Mama. Saying those two words was often the best way to survive, as was doing what she was told. And from there, Lisa walked the streets of mulching, from the poor end to the rich, picking up and delivering the washing. At first, it was a solitary job, which she never complained about. After all, the very first time she took the sack through town, she turned the corner onto Munich Street, uh, look, looked both ways and gave it one enormous swing, a whole revolution, and then checked the contents inside. Thankfully, there were no creases, no wrinkles, just a smile and a promise never to swing it again. Overall, Liesel enjoyed it. There was no share of the pay, but she was out of the house and walking the streets without Mama, without Mama was heaven in itself. No finger pointing or cursing. No people staring at them as she was sworn at for holding the bag wrong. Nothing but serenity. She came to like the people too. The Fappelhervers inspecting the clothes and saying, ja, ja, sir, gut, sir, gut. Liesel imagined that they did everything twice. Gentle Hel Helena Schmidt, handing the money over with an arthritic curl of the hand. The vine gardeners, whose bent whiskered cat always answered the door with them. Little Gobbles, that's what they called him after Hitler's right-hand man. And Froy Herman, the mayor's wife, standing fluffy haired and shivery in the enormous cold air doorway. Always silent, always alone, no words, not once. Sometimes Rudy came along. How much money do you have there? He asked one afternoon. It was nearly dark and they were walking onto Himmel Street, past the shop. You've heard about Freud Dealer, haven't you? They say she's got a candy hidden somewhere and for the right price, don't even think about it. Liesel, as always, was gripping the money hard. It's not so bad for you. You don't have to face my mama, Rudy shrugged. It was worth a try. In the middle of January, schoolwork turned its attention to letter writing. After learning the basics, each student has, was to write two letters, one to a friend and one to somebody in another class. 
Liesl's letter from Rudy went like this. Dear Samage, are you still as useless as, at soccer as you were the last time we played? I hope so. That means I can run past you again, just like Jesse Owens at the Olympics. When Sister Maria found it, she asked him a question, very amiably. Sister Maria's offer. Do you feel like visiting the corridor, Mr. Steiner? Needless to say, Rudy answered in the negative, and the paper was torn up and he started again. A second attempt was written to someone named Liesel and inquired as to what her hobbies might be. At home, while completing a letter for homework, Liesel decided that writing to Rudy or some other soft girl was actually ridiculous. It meant nothing. As she wrote in the basement, she spoke over to Papa, who was repainting the wall again. Both he and the paint fumes turned around. Was wist? Now, this was the roughest form of German a person could speak, but it was spoken with an air of absolute pleasantness. Yeah, what? Would I be able to write a letter to Mama? A pause. What do you want to write a letter to her for? You have to put up with her every day. Papa was schmaltzling. A sly smile. Isn't that bad enough? Not that, Mama, she swallowed. Oh. Papa returned to the wall and continued painting. Well, I guess so. You could send it to what's-her-name, the one who brought you here and visited those few times from the foster people, Froy Heinrich. That's right. Send it to her. Maybe she can send it on to your mother. Even at the time, he sounded unconvincing, as if he wasn't telling Liesel something. Word of her mother had all also been tight-lipped on Froy Heinrich's brief visits. Instead of visiting him... Instead of asking him what was wrong, Liesel began writing immediately, choosing to ignore the sense of foreboding that was quick to accumulate inside her. It took three hours and six drafts to perfect the letter, telling her mother all about mulching, her papa and his accordion, the strange but true ways of Rudy Steiner, and the exploits of Rosa Huberman. She also explained how proud she was that she could now read and write a little. The next day, she posted it at Froy Diller's with a stamp from the kitchen drawer, and she began to wait. The night she wrote the letter, she overheard a conversation between Hans and, and Rosa. What's she doing writing to her mother, Mama was saying. Her voice was surprisingly calm and caring. As you can imagine, this worried the girl a great deal. She'd have preferred to hear them arguing, whispering adults hardly inspired confidence. She asked me, Papa answered, and I couldn't say no. How could I? Jesus, Mary and Joseph, again with a whisper. She should just forget her. Who knows where she is? Who knows what they've done to her? In bed, Liesel hugged herself tight. She balled herself up. She thought of her mother and repeated Rosa Huberman's questions. Where was she? What had they done to her? And once and for all, who, in actual fact, were they? Dead Letters Flash forward to the basement, September 1943. A 14-year-old girl is writing in a small, dark-covered book. She is bony but strong and has seen many things. Papa sits with the accordion at his feet. He says, you know, Liesel... I nearly wrote you a reply and signed your mother's name. He scratches his leg where the plaster used to be, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself. Several times through the remainder of January and the entirety of February 1940, when Liesel searched the mailbox for a reply to her letter, it cl clearly broke her foster father's heart. I'm sorry, he would tell her. Not today, huh? In hindsight, she saw that the whole exercise had been pointless. Had her mother been in a position to do so, she would have already made contact with the foster care people or directly with the girl or the Hubermans but there had been nothing. To lend insult to injury in mid-February, Liesel was given a letter from another ironing customer, the Fafelhervers, from Hyde Strauss. The pair of them stood with great tallness in the doorway, giving her a melancholic regard. For your mama, the man said, handing her the envelope. Tell her we're sorry. Tell her we're sorry. That was not a good night in the Huberman residence. Even, the, even when Liesel retreated to the basement to write her fifth letter to her mother, all but the first one yet to be sent, she could hear Rosa swearing and carrying on about Fafelherver, Arschlocker, and that lousy Ernst Vogel. Foy sollen brunzen für einen Monat, she heard her call out. Translation, they should all piss fire for a month, Liesel wrote. When her birthday came around, there was no gift. There was no gift because there was no money, and at the time, Papa was out of tobacco. I told you, Mama pointed a finger at him, I told you not to give her book, both books at Christmas, but no, did you listen? Of course not. I know, he turned quietly to the girl. I'm sorry, Liesel, we just can't afford it. Liesel didn't mind. She didn't whine or moan or stamp her feet. She, she simply swallowed the disappointment and decided on one calculated risk, a present from herself. She would gather all of the accrued letters to her mother, stuff them into one envelope, and use just a tiny portion of the washing and ironing money to mail it. Then, of course, she would take the, wa the washen, most likely in the kitchen, and she would not make a sound. Three days later, the plan came to fruition. Some of it's missing, 
Mama counted the money a fourth time with Lisa over at the stove. It was warm there and it cooked the fast flow of her blood. What happened, Liesel? She lied. They must have given me less than usual. Did you count it? She broke. I spent it, Mama. Rosa came closer. This was not a good sign. She was very close to the wooden spoons. You what? Before she could answer, the wooden spoon came down on Liesel Memminger's body like the gate of God. Red marks like footprints, and they burned. From the floor, when it was over, the girl actually looked up and explained. There was pulse and yellow light all together. Her eyes blinked. I mailed my letters. What came to her then was the dustiness of the floor, the feeling that her clothes were more, were more next to her than on her, and the sudden realization that this would all be for nothing, that her mother would never write back and she would never see her again. The reality of, of this gave her a second fashion. It stung her and it did not stop for many minutes. Above her, Rosa appeared to be smudged, but she soon clarified as her cardboard face loomed closer. Dejected, she stood there in, a, in all her plumpness, holding the wooden spoon at her side like a club. She reached down and leaked a little. I'm sorry, Liesel. Liesel knew her well enough to understand that it was not for the hiding. The red marks grew larger in patches on her skin as she lay there in the dust and the dirt and the dim light. Her breathing calmed and a stray yellow tear trickled down her face. She could feel herself against the floor, a forearm, a knee, an elbow, a cheek, a calf muscle. The floor was cold, especially against her cheek, but she was unable to move. She would never see her mother again. For nearly an hour, she remained spread out under the kitchen table till Papa came home and played the accordion. Only then did she sit up and start to recover. When she wrote about that night, she held no animosity toward Rosa Huberman at all, or toward her mother, for that matter. To her, they were only victims of circumstance. The only thought that continually recurred was the yellow tear. Had it been dark, she realized that tear would have been black. But it was dark, she told herself. No matter how many times she tried to imagine that scene with the yellow light that she knew had been there, she had to struggle to visualize it. She was beaten in the dark, and she had remained there, on a cold, dark kitchen floor. Even Papa's music was the color of darkness. Even Papa's music. The strange thing was that she was vaguely comforted by that thought, rather than distressed by it. The dark, the light. What was the difference? Nightmares had reinforced themselves in each as the book thief began to truly understand how things were and how they were always they would always be. If nothing else, she could prepare herself. Perhaps that's why on the Freud's birthday, when the answer to the question of her mother's suffering showed itself completely, she was able to react, despite her perplexity and her rage. Liesel Memminger was ready. Happy birthday, Herr, Herr Hitler. Many happy returns.